uh, yeah, we'll just have a few uh, folks that are starting. Uh, so we are recording today's meeting, and as is our tradition, uh, based on our local privacy laws here, if you don't wish to be recorded, then you should leave now, but we hope that you don't. Uh, so, uh, welcome everybody to the 79th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group, uh, hosted uh, by OCAD University Strategic Innovation Lab, the SLAB. Uh, I am here in Toronto, and we have uh, people from Toronto and elsewhere on the call. I respond to the question in the chat indicating uh, where you are uh, and uh, other information to add that uh, to the uh, agenda page uh, in our wiki. For today and uh, Nicole is sharing the top level wiki and we'll share the agenda page in a moment uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about, about our speaker. So in the, in the interest of keeping the focus on the content, uh, we uh, just record participation on the agenda page and let people find out who they are and we can uh, update it. So um, just to quickly introduce the, the group for those of you who haven't uh, seen the introduction before. Um, we are the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. We're exploring how to enable entrepreneurs and established businesses to uh, uh, realize enterprises that choose flourishing as their goal. And that's been the work of our community of innovation practice since 2012. A quick acknowledgement of our privilege. Um, this is a, a tradition that we've had uh, because of our, um, uh, originating because of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that we had in Canada, between Canada uh, and the First Peoples that were here before the settlers. Uh, and so we like to do an acknowledgement. Obviously, we're a global group, so we've generalized this uh, to uh, uh, help you consider these questions from wherever you happen to be. So this is sacred land on which each of us are privileged uh, to be today. This land, the nearby lakes and sea, has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge, and tradition. And we're pr privileged to be the beneficiaries and stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honor and respect peoples indigenous to your place, including, of course, for many of you yourselves. And today, each place around the world is increasingly a home peoples from across the world, and we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be with today. In addition to that more socially orientated recognition, we also like to do a biophysical recognition. So this photograph is, is where I am at the moment. I'm at the far end of that uh, building, the lower part of that building, and this is uh, downtown Toronto, the open, part of the OCAD campus with the CN Tower in the background. And so uh, we would like to ask you, do you know what watershed you are in? Uh, you can respond in the chat if you do happen to know. Uh, where I am today, uh, I'm sitting uh, on the edge of a watershed that's known by the settlers as Russell Creek. Uh, we buried that to become a sewer in the mid-1870s and uh, uh, uncertain of its indigenous names. Uh, and uh, of course, this session is Deliberate is interdependent in important ways on place, uh, not least for those of you uh, who use the toilet at some point, think about where that's connected to and you're dependent on the ecosystem service. And for those of you who know the Flourishing Business Canvas, of course, this is why biophysical stocks and ecosystem services are on the canvas, because in fact, we are interdependent on, our, on the place we are in, in many different uh, ways. So that's a recognition of place. So who are we? Uh, we are 1,500 people globally now, uh, and uh, we are the world's first or only group taking action to undertake enterprise strategy and to do organizational design action research from a micro-ecological economic perspective. So the ecological economics being those few economists who recognize that the economy is embedded in society, which is embedded in the environment. And we use systemic design as our fundamental epistemological approach, although we obviously uh, leverage and use uh, descriptive science approaches as well. Um, and we have a strong normative purpose, which is enabling the possibility for flourishing. So this is what we believe differentiates us from some other groups out there doing work uh, around enterprise strategy and business modeling and business design. So we get you, uh, we are the home for you. Uh, and uh, we, we put our members, we put into practice what our members uh, do research around and, and the latest thinking. So if you're taking the OCAD, NDES, SFI program, or similar programs, we, we can help. And we offer a global network of possibilities for your education, your research, and employment. Uh, group goals, I won't go through this in detail uh, because I have some good news, which I want to share instead. Uh, so um, as many of you know, the SSBMG uh, it's start, it's now the 79th meeting. We've been going since the beginning of 2012. And for the last two years, we've had an aspiration to move from being a volunteer group to a flourishing enterprise institute. 
so this uh, was initiated by us as a new tank. Um, and the, the idea is that we need to have a, a planetary-wide network of nodes undertaking action research and developing innovation practices to realize flourishing enterprises worldwide. Uh, and I'm pleased to announce that because of uh, our new partner, the Wiesman Center for Engagement in Research and Sustainability at Wilfrid Laurier, uh, we're going to be hosting the first node of this network. Uh, we now have funding through SHRP here in Canada uh, to hold a research agenda setting meeting uh, for the Institute, uh, which SSBMG members are invited to join uh, in August of this year. Uh, it's just after the Academy of Management uh, meeting. And so uh, if you would like to participate in that, uh, please contact me or Nicole or as one of our community animators uh, and we will get you connected into that uh, process. So the idea of this meeting is to uh, build on the, the work that uh, some of our members have already done on the research agenda for strongly sustainable and flourishing business models uh, and all the things around business models and to come up with a research agenda we can use to go and get more funding to build the institute to conduct the important research and development that we need to do. So this is really good news. Uh, the SSBMG is evolving. Absolutely delighted. Uh, found this out just a couple of weeks ago that this is happening, less than a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the Flourishing Enterprise Institute, of course, is part of a growing planetary movement for flourishing. Uh, here's a, a sample of organizations and others who are involved who are either claiming alignment or we see them as being aligned with what we're doing and of course this is very much in sync with the SDGs but indeed going beyond the SDGs because uh, as much as the SDGs are an amazing gift from humanity to ourselves of course they are a political compromise and, and strong sustainability is formally taking a science-based approach so that's where we're trying to go beyond. Uh, we have lots of projects of our members I just throw up the logos of six of them with a couple more that are trying to get started. Uh, all of these projects will be uh, uh, helped and enhanced by the Institute. Um, we're starting to figure that out now. And of course, we have a number of other connections to other communities doing similar work. So uh, here's the article by our leading member, Florian Ludek Freud, who's uh, setting, starting to set the research agenda for us. <coughs> we have the Systemic Design Conference for our epistemology. Uh, next conference is in October. There's the New Business Models Conference in Berlin, at which many of us will be attending and presenting. Uh, we've got the work of Reporting 3.0 uh, on new business models that's uh, uh, also their conference is uh, in um, end of June uh, in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, many of us will be there. Uh, we've got our blog, Sustainable Business Models. Uh, we've also got the Institute for Evolutionary Leadership, uh, the B Corp Academic Community, and uh, here in Canada, the Academy for Sustainable Innovation are all connections and community that we work with. Won't go through some of the work we're doing in any more detail. Um, I'll leave this slide in here. Uh, we are trying to get some additional projects moving. We hope the Flourishing Enterprise Institute will help with this. Um, but uh, this community has always been for our members, by our members. So if you've got an interest, you want to get some collaboration going on, particularly topic related to our research interests, then uh, uh, here's something you could get involved in or you can propose your own. So we also have our monthly meetings, of which, of course, this is one example, and uh, we've been doing that since 2012. Here's four recent examples of what we've been presenting. Uh, all of the presentations since the beginning practically are in our uh, wiki, listed in the wiki, and the, the presentations and recordings uh, are in our Google Drive, and we will be sharing this one afterwards as well. Um, if you're a grad student or a researcher, we've got a list of ideas, and again, this will be input into our research agenda. Uh, and uh, opportunity as a researcher to get engaged with our, our community. So with that, all of that said, I'd like to hand over to this month's uh, speaking speaker, Oliver Lash, uh, who's going to be speaking uh, about uh, business model chemistry for sustainability. And um, uh, Oliver, I'll let you know how you'd like to handle questions, uh, whether you'd like to talk for a bit and then take questions or take it as you go. And uh, with that, I hand it over to you. Let me stop sharing and uh, allow you to uh, take over. Yes. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, may, may, may I say thank you as well. I really enjoyed actually your, your introduction to the place and uh, kind of reminding us how we depend on where we are and what's been before us and how we connect to what's coming after us. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm, I, I have to, uh, to clarify one thing before I start going. I'm not a chemist. Uh, I'm not an alchemist either. So. Um, 
the, the metaphor that I'm going to use for my presentation today is one that um, came out of the, the work in, in business models I've been doing for the last uh, six, seven years, roughly, maybe a little bit longer, longer than that, including the practical work. Um, and uh, what, what I'm trying, trying to achieve today, hopefully, is to uh, take one step back to go, to take one stride, uh, two strides forward. Um, and the one step back is to uh, um, start rethinking once again what are actually business models. And I'm not um, really trying to uh, um, uh, kind of restart this whole discussion about what should be the boxes on the canvas and uh, which one should be in which position. So it's not that kind of um, thinking back, but it's rather about um, how do we are we actually able to uh, grasp how business models materialize. So how do we find the business model? How do we experience the business model? How do we touch the business model? And after all, how do we actually change it? Because we know what it is, which I'm not always sure we are. Uh, we, we do know. So um, anyway, before, before I get into the presentation, just maybe very, very quickly on who, uh, who I am. Um, I'm at the University of Nottingham Ningbo in uh, China, University of Nottingham's uh, Chinese campus. Um, I am a officially a strategy professor, which is strange in a certain way because where I come from are more social, environmental, and ethical topics, but also very fitting because um, through my PhD work back then, I was actually able to bring a business model as a strategy concept uh, together with social, environmental, and ethical topics. Um, and uh, so let me just let me just start the presentation. Hopefully, I'm not missing something here. It's four o'clock in the morning, uh, so apologies if I appear a little bit unorganized, which I probably am right now, particularly in my head. Um, I, I assume you can see the presentation now, can you? Uh, not uh, not yet. No. Okay, that's interesting because I oh I should sorry I should do the sharing again, right? So that yes, that's correct. That's probably helpful. There we go. And, and congratulations for getting up at four o'clock in the morning. I, I, often we yes. have people, people presenting from Europe late at night, but I've forgotten that you are actually <laughs> very early in the morning. So thank you very much for getting well, no up. No worries, no worries. It's, it's my pleasure. It really, really is. And uh, well, I, I probably have to give credits to my wife as well, who was putting two alarms and uh, kind of pushing <laughs> me out of the bed. So that, that definitely helped. Uh, good. So let's see. Um, Yes. So you can see my uh, PowerPoint now, can you? Yeah. If you just put that into slideshow, we should be good. Yes, that's that's happening right now. Okay. Good. Excellent. Um, good. So where to begin, really? Um, I don't, so so this is kind of the end point of the presentation. I just wanted to show that because I felt probably it's it's uh, good to know where we're going as we go. Um, and in terms of questions, Anthony, um, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions uh, anytime. I just realized uh, right now I cannot see the chat. Um, so if there's something bubbling up in the chat, please uh, do let me know. Um, if you just want to switch on your microphone and interrupt me anytime, it's very, very welcome. Um, and I would hope to actually do get quite a discussion going. Um, so. I want to give you just a snippet, kind of a, a preview on the practical parts of, of the presentation. So um, that's the kind of little goodies after we go through the, uh, the, the, the more kind of demanding, harder stuff, if you want. So, um, so we're going to talk about three cases. Actually, I just added a fourth case um, um, to it, which I thought makes a lot of sense. Um, so we're going to talk about um, how responsibility sustainability has been embedded into a big retailer for confidentiality reasons. I'm not meant to say which one it is, but I think the example is still quite good and insightful. Then we're going to talk about supposedly circular bike sharing in uh, China. So very uh, practical hands-on experience I'm having day-to-day uh, -day while living here, but also we had a small research project on that. And then we're going to talk about the, uh, the business model of Allsafe, which is a um, automobile and um, a space industry supplier um, in Germany. And they're, they're supposedly having a humanistic and agile business model. And then the, th the fourth one, which I just added, is on the company Grayston Bakery, um, a B Corp, which is uh, all centered on 
open hiring. So the business model is built around the idea of open hiring. So this is kind of the practical goodies, which I hope hopefully don't lose you folks before we get to them. Uh, but what, what I'm hoping to happen is that uh, we will actually be able to use this metaphor, this idea of business model chemistry to, on the one hand, understand those cases better, but on the other hand, also to start thinking about how can we actually use that idea in order to change business models more effectively. And if I'm saying effectively, I'm not me meaning effective in an economic sense, but effective rather in a sense of to have a, a change that's, um, that's relevant, that's considerable, and a change that's, that's tangible. Um, but let's, we're, we're gonna get to that in, in just a moment. Um, so here's the, the one big step back. Um, so what, what are business models actually made of? So um, this is very much an, an apologies for getting philosophical to you folks, uh, probably easier for you and for, for something in the afternoon than for me for, for in the morning, but um, the nature of being. So what, what are business models actually? Um, and how can we experience this? them and the idea of ontology is not really one that's that's um, unusual for business model thinking because I think one of the very early origins which is more the one on the right hand side is um, actually this business model ontology by Alexander Osterwald and of course there's been uh, other people before him uh, leading up to that work uh, uh, um, for Gene, for instance um, but I would like to take, take a small step back even from that because before we get to the ontology in more a computer science information system sense where this one came from, we do have the philosophical uh, um, study of being, which is ontology. So what, what is the, the business model? How does it become? What's the reality of the business model? And of course, if we understand that a little bit better, well, hopefully it's easier to actually do change business models, to create business models that are flourishing, that are strongly sustainable. Um, so here's just a couple of uh, uh, examples from that. Well, of course, there is uh, Mr. Anthony Upward's uh, work on the strongly sustainable one as well. So another type of ontology. Um, but um, as mentioned before, I, I really want to go one step further, which is the example down there from Academy of Management Review. Review. So really the question of what do we claim is reality? Um, and what do we claim is the reality of, um, of a business model? Um, so in order to not lose you from the very onset, from the very beginning, could I just, just quickly get uh, maybe in the chat or you want to speak up an idea about, so, so, so what, what is, so emphasis on is the business model to you? So how do you, what is the reality of the business model? How, how can you folks experience it? Any ideas? I know that's, that's probably a tricky experiment so early in the beginning, but let's see if I can get you folks a little bit active. Anthony typing over there. So also please, please feel free to just speak up to unmute your microphone and say something at so, any so, time. So, so, I'm, I'm, I'm about to agree with Simon. So what, is, sorry, I, I need to leave. Uh, so Simon said, I've still not found anyone who is, who, are you, who is using the business model canvas who knows about Osterwald's ontology. I asked this oh, question. Really? Oh, really? That's surprising uh, to me. That's, that's, very, that's, uh, I, I, that's my experience too. Yeah, and I, I, I also that's, that's surprising to me. Great. Okay. Uh, I, I, I've also my, my experience, and I'm I, I know other some others here have had a similar experience, but I'm curious as well. In fact, most people we meet uh, in the work we're doing have not heard of the business model canvas. Oh, seriously? Yeah. So that, so they know oh, this. The, very surprising. That they know that they know the idea of a business model. Um, right. They know it's important. But the idea that you could describe it using a visual framework, uh, using a standard language, uh, yeah. is, is uh, still not super common. I mean, you know, Osterwald has sold a lot of books, but in yeah. the grand scheme of things, he's not sold very many books at all. Huh. This is interesting, yeah. It's really interesting to me. I know a lot of people working with business model canvas, and they don't even know the word ontology. They don't know that Osterwald has published business model. Right. Um, so business model is really a case of, it's just the visual tool to get everyone on the same page as to what, why the um, business, the business, and, and um, you know, its principal functions. Yeah, interesting. 
So that, that's, that's a really good learning for me as well, because I was, I actually, before I started knowing about the, the word business model itself, I was using the, the canvas back in, in Mexico, the first, well, the second university I, I worked at actually, and we were helping people in the uh, incubation process. So I got to know the business model as that visual, and I didn't even know it was called business model at that point in time. So that's interesting because for me, the experience was exactly the, op the opposite way around. In, in specific places, and I would say incubators and accelerators because of lean startup, yeah. Um, it, there, if you, if you grew up, if you grow up in that world, you can't imagine it not being known. Yeah. But outside of that yeah. very small world, you know, you talk yeah. to most business leaders, they haven't heard of it in established yeah. organizations. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, and remember it's, it's not, it's not taught in business schools cause it's a design tool and business schools teach analytical thinking. They don't teach design thinking. So it's yeah, not well, I mean, to, to, to somebody, although I, I must say that if I find business, business models in business schools, typically the, the canvas is somehow uh, related to them. So I just, just early today, actually had a chat with my uh, colleague, Haibu Joe, uh, who's teaching social enter, the, the social enterprise uh, class here. And she explicitly uses the business model canvas, it's actually three different versions of the canvas as well. So that's one thing. And then the other one is that, um, so and I, I don't know if you're somehow different here, but I'm assuming we're not in that sense. Uh, but also the uh, a strategy colleague who, who teaches a class called strategy process and practice. Um, he actually builds up much of the strategy implementation uh, on, on the canvas and on business model thinking. So and I didn't have anything to do with it. So, so that, that in both of those cases that ca indigenously came out of their work. Um, I'm, being, I'm being a little bit, I'm being a little bit provocative, and I know that that provocative statement is getting a little out of date. But nevertheless, I'm yeah, 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 yeah. But that's good. That's really good. Okay, thank. Well, thanks everybody for for getting getting into the conversation so early on. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Um, so so now that we're already talking about the business model canvas, so uh, the. In, in my understanding, um, and, and I just have, have a very little background in the kind of information systems, management information systems world out of which uh, much of that, that kind of thinking came originally. Uh, but in my understanding, this is very much along the lines of this, this uh, definition on the right here in computer science. So you're trying to kind of chop things up into all of its uh, uh, pieces so that you actually can translate it into uh, like pro probably most of the uh, uh, extreme case into a information system structure which represents the whole reality uh, in this case the reality being uh, your organization or your business um, so, so this is one way of seeing ontology which I think is very valid um, although if we go into the philosophical world um, and partic particularly uh, uh, kind of the metaphysical world what we teach in um, uh, in, in research philosophy, which is one of the courses I'm teaching for our PhDs around here, the question really goes even one level deeper, but we're going to get to that just in a, just in a moment. But so originally, this is where the, the, the business model ontology came from. This is uh, just screenshot out of Alexander Osterwald's original uh, thesis. So up here, you see it saying business model ontology. Do, do you guys actually see my uh, cursor when I'm moving it? Yes, yes, we do. we do. Okay. Great. So this is this up here. So those very four very basic uh, areas: the product, customer interface, infrastructure management. He called it back then, and financial aspects. And he's also linking it back to a, to a couple of other very well-known uh, concepts, ideas in uh, business and organization, or rather business and management studies. Um, so then he's saying, well, we're actually moving from that low level of granularity, those four areas, to something that's a little bit more sophisticated and detailed and more splitting it up into, and this is already very close to the canvas, product, meaning value proposition, custom interface, being target customer distribution, and so on. So you folks know all those stuff, I, uh, all those, those uh, um, uh, segments, uh, parts of the, the canvas, the building blocks because this is what uh, uh, probably everybody's very familiar with. So those are the very same ones. So this is one type of business model ontology, one description of what the business model actually is. Um, but if we go, well, and then of course we do have uh, kind of the more sophisticated uh, and more updated and more, more kind of world conscious uh, sustainability, strongly sustainable versions like uh, your, your own Anthony. Uh, but still, we see the very same uh, type of structures. So we do have uh, what uh, Alex Osterwalder had over here as customers, but a little bit more broadly as stakeholders. Uh, we have the processes over here, which is more the kind of value creation part that we had on, on the left-hand side. 
uh, measurement instead of only calling it financial or economic factors because well we're not only in a financial and economic world so i would say that's more kind of the world open uh, idea of what it is and then the, of course the different context and apologies for obviously getting it all wrong because you know it much better than than i do uh, anthony but you, you, um, you did a fine job of summarizing it all of it. <laughs> um but again, so it's it's a kind of description of what, what it is, but still we don't, and, and of course I, I have my own version of, of, of that, which uh, is not as sophisticated, but goes uh, along the, the, the same line, lines of thinking very much. But still I think all of those step one, uh, uh, are one step short of um, actually thinking so, so, but how can we actually touch it, see it, feel it, experience it? Uh, so, so what is that actually once once it becomes real? Because right now what we're looking at is just an image which is still on a very removed conceptual level. But what is the real business model one we, once we're actually looking in, into businesses? So is it just a piece of paper? Is it just the canvas that we print out? Is it the, the, the canvas that we start working on, on on a whiteboard and start filling in all of the different bits and pieces of our business? Because if we... Uh, so what we're typically doing is trying to uh, create new businesses or change businesses based on that canvas, right? But the question is there really very much, does it become real? Is it something that stays on the canvas or does it actually change the business reality itself? And uh, one of my PhD students, Xuan um, Ye, uh, um, is a um, venture capitalist. So he is very much uh, in the business of making um, business plans respectively often the the kind of business model descriptions inside business plans real um, so but the question there is there's really he was telling me telling me today so uh, that there's a lot of research on how how real a business plan and a business model canvas included in that actually becomes uh, so to what degree does the businessman match business performance for instance and he was was telling me that there's kind of a a huge difference that uh, very often the business plans are more pieces of fiction than they are uh, a and actually have have an actually planning purpose or that they're actually really be, really becoming something that that, that exists afterwards um, so this this is really the the intent of going one level below that that type of ontology describing the uh, the elements on a conceptual theoretical level but really thinking about what it actually is and I'm using that um, chemistry metaphor here um, to once again get one, trying to get this one level deep and trying to see what is it actually once we look at it um, in a real organization, in a real business. And I'm just uh, stopping for a moment to see what's going on in the, the chat window as well to make sure I'm uh, keeping up to date with the discussion as well. So just a moment trying to navigate this here. Um, so yeah, there just, is... I was just Simon. making sure this is... Yes, please, is, speak up, Simon. Speak. Yeah. This is really, sorry for not introducing myself fully, but for the sake of time, it's in the chat. This is a really interesting question when you said, how do people really connect with the business model? Because um, my wife and I, Maria, we teach um, customer experience at business schools. And it's incredible how a lot of people struggle with the question, what is a customer experience? Mm. And this is where the business model and the value proposition are, are fully articulated in the world of people and some people struggle it's, and think oh a customer experience is only for wealthy people it's only for people who can really afford a high mm. quality business it's like no every single business model and value proposition is expressed in a customer experience i think this mm -hmm. is a really interesting discussion uh because many people inside of organizations are not connected with the customer experience which is where right. the model is expressed. So that was the point I was trying to make. I think your question is really excellent. Uh, and, and, I, and I think I, I want to th uh, throw in the, the perhaps very obvious thing to say, which a business model doesn't exist in reality because it's a model. Mm -hmm. it, it's a it is by definition a representation, a partial representation of right. reality, of, an, of experience. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, if, if we're asking, um, well, are we asking Oliver with this chemistry question, uh, what are the elements of the reality, or are we asking the elements of the model of reality? Which, which question right. are you asking? Yes. 
Um, so I, I start I start with one and end up with the other one. Thanks for for actually bringing me back in by uh, by by asking that question. But let me just see. There's one more chat. Uh, uh, contribution is uh, this the tension between transactional focus and the relational focus at the heart of the business model? Okay, interesting question. Yeah, so I think we we're, we're going to get get to that, uh, uh, Douglas, and maybe you, you can bring it up once again, particularly when we talk about um, those different cases, because I think that's something that's that's probably best discussed uh, l looking at those real cases. Um, so, so Anthony, your your point about um, Oh, now no, I've got the chat window in front of my presentation, which actually is helpful. Sorry, let me let me see. I think now something funny happened. Um, oh, now I now I'm back. Okay. Um, so, so Andy, your your question: What are we talking about the, uh, uh, the the model, or are we talking about the reality? And are we talking about the uh, the, the elements of the model and the reality? And hope hopefully um, we're doing both in a certain way. Um, because if you so if you go back to what what Alex Osterwalder called a kind of more uh, kind of a rough um, uh, kind of structure of the business model, just those four elements, um, I think we get something that we probably find both in the models and in um, the the real business model, whatever that is. We're going to get get to that just in a moment. So and I'm sticking to the uh, the chemistry metaphor. I'm trying to do something very similar to you see. There's hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. So that's the non-chemist speaking, of course. I'm very ignorant in terms of those. I'm a little bit more knowledgeable about um, the uh, the respective elements uh, on the business model side. So typically, I'm uh, I'm trying to break them down in in those kind of very broad categories. So the proposition which we just talked about, then there's certain value creation activities. So often you call that kind of the value architecture, the things you do and the the things you have in place in order to create that value exchange. So somehow you have to move value between your different stakeholders. If we go back to Anthony's model, uh, as much in the value creation, you exchange value uh, back and forth at, as also in the actual use and uh, capture of the value after all. Um, uh, interesting, I, I've, I've gotten uh, quite a bit of uh, criticism on the exchange part because people, particularly reviewers and journals, particularly strategy journals, say, no, this should be delivery because the value is going from the organization, from the company to the customer. <laughs> yeah, well, fair enough. But at the same time, in, 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 in an actually not entirely commercial world, if you took, look at a little bit less uh, simplistic organizations, well, it is exchanged back and forth. We've got co-creation activities and so on. So. Uh, just staying on the delivery side for me doesn't work, but I understand that there's people who see that differently. So, so Oliver, the, the, the way we've dealt with people who don't understand this is we, we point them towards the um, uh, service uh, oriented, service dominant logic rather than product yeah. logic. Yeah. And that you, and given that that came out of marketing with no, uh, in, a, in a completely profit normative uh, yeah. environment, it, that usually helps people understand why we don't like uh, value right. positions and uh, but we like value co-creations and, and value exchange yeah. yeah yeah and interestingly something i just realized yesterday preparing that for for that presentation was that alex osterwald actually using value exchange um in his very thesis so apparently he still had kind of a more open perspective if i may interpret that while he's not here um, in, in terms of how value it moves around in, in those structures. Yeah, uh, yeah. So not just from, from left to right, yeah. So it was when the canvas uh, decided on the icon of the, of the gift wrapped present that he moved from value exchange, right. uh, at least superficially value from exchange to, to value delivery. Yes, yes, excellent. No, uh, so, so I was actually very happy to see that because now I can say, look into the original publications. Actually, that's not something new. It's been there forever. But, um, but the point I'm trying to make is that uh, at least when we stay on the conceptual level, so on our removed abstract level of what the business model is, we actually know quite well what those different elements of the business model are. And of course, we probably disagree um, on the, the exact words from time to time, and we might disagree on uh, kind of the subcategories we've got under those elements, but on on, on that that kind of uh, granular level, as as Alex Osterwald called it, well, well here we we probably most of us do agree. So, but the question then still is, um, and you called it a a logic before. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, before you, before you move off this slide, um, yeah. I, I so um, in this group we've got quite a few people who know the viable systems model by Stafford Beer. And so the term viability is one that get, we, we tend to band around a lot. 
And um, I've always personally had a bit of a problem with the idea of value capture uh, because in the profit first way, it, it's all about uh, you, you measure the, whether or not you're capturing in, in terms of financial profit. And so I, I wonder um, how, how would it feel to you if, if we said viability equals PCE, PCR, PCRE, I should say, and, and capture was actually the result, which is viability. Could be, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that would be one good way of, of uh, describing the capture. I mean, for, for me, the all of those those elements, I, I'm trying to choose the, the 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 broadest and most open kind of mental image of, of what they are. So for capture, for instance, right now we are uh, we're in the process of publishing the the paper that you guys mentioned in the uh, um, in the in, in my introduction and in the the invite, which uh, the, this. Um, how did the leopards get their spot paper? Where we're looking at FTSE 100 companies' descriptions of business model and how they bring sustainability, responsibility, ethics in there. And so when when we we are uh, trying to identify value capture, which is not the traditional commercial value capture among those companies, they it comes in many different ways. So they talk about um, the triple bottom line, which would be, uh, of course, once again this kind of static capture. But they also talk about capture in terms of their license to operate so being able to continue the business so and that's that's closer probably to your notion um or they talk about capture in terms of uh community welfare or they're talking about uh pearson the education company they're talking about uh, um, valuable learning for their their uh, the, the people using their educational materials so um I, I think capture can come in, in many different forms and one of the forms and going back to ontology there is not necessarily having kind of a static capture look we've got a bucket and that's in there but capture can also be the continuation of uh, of the business and uh, Sally Randles and I, in that, that kind of very cryptic and hard to read paper that we did for organization environment, especially same special issue that yours was in, um, there, there we are actually talking about economic uh, reproduction mechanisms or more broadly reproduction mechanisms. So this is more along the lines of viability about long-term existence, uh, not sustainability as an outcome, but sustainability as a process type of thinking, what, what capture could be. Yeah. So, so I, I, I've without being too knowledgeable about, about Stafford Beer's uh, um, work, I, I, I think some aspects of it actually go quite uh, closely to, well, well, at least going into that direction to some degree, yeah. Um, good, so basically, uh, so, so this is where the, the, the metaphor came from originally. Uh, I was looking at this and was thinking, oh, well, okay. Uh, so that looks a little bit like uh, a chemical formula like, like H2, uh, H2O, for instance. So. Um, and then I started thinking, okay, so why, um, so what can we actually learn from that metaphor? So if you think it through in those ways, we uh, actually know that um, H2O as, as, as water not only comes in the liquid form, right? So we know it uh, comes in gas form as well, it comes in solid form as ice. And we do know that there are certain processes between those uh, aggregate states. Um, that, um, that, that move it from one form into another. So I was thinking, hmm, so what might that actually me mean on uh, a business model level? Um, so, and if you use that, that kind of metaphor then to ask a couple of questions. So um, is it actually, so, so what is this, uh, uh, this, this strange logic that we have underlying uh, the business model as a model? So the kind of conceptual representation is that that logic, um, that PCEC or however you want to call it, is that formula actually something that materializes that manifests in reality as well? Or is it something that just uh, kind of people who think more conceptually, theoretically use in order to, to make sense of the world? Or is it something that actually exists? If it exists, does it just float in the air somewhere? Or, or where is it? What is it? Um, and then, of course, also but for, for me being as a, a researcher, interesting is how can we actually study it? So how can we see it, experience it, measure it, hear it? How can we actually start saying there is something that we can study and that we can analyze? And uh, then the third question, of course, and that, that's one that has a lot of practical implications, is once we, once we know what it is, how can we actually change it? So how does the reality of a business model change? Has it changed just because we changed the canvas? So let's imagine there's, uh, there's this uh, kind of consultant coming, coming into an existing corporation and saying, Ooh, we're going to change your business model now. Look, we've got this great canvas and I printed it out in um, A0 format. So we've got it on a, on a really huge scale. You guys change your business model right now. 
just start drawing things on the canvas and it uh, miraculously is going to materialize in your business. Does that mean the business model changed? Does that actually mean anything we're doing that? Um, so those, those are the type of questions I would like to kind of explore with you folks a little bit. And it really is an exploration because I have never done that presentation before. And I've talked about those topics in different forms and discussed it. But really, this is an experiment, hopefully, together with you to, to find out how can we uh, get something out of those questions and uh, to find out how those, those questions actually make sense. So that, that um, point about existence, I'm just looking at the chat window real quick here. Right, so, so once again, strategy development execution as well, right? So if you talk about strategy execution, we, we wanna know that something materializes. We wanna know that the strategy just does, doesn't uh, just st stay somewhere uh, as a cloud in the air. It's something that actually materializes in the business and that, that does make a change, yeah. Um, so, and if you look into uh, the kind of more theoretical world of business models, uh, probably some of you folks know this uh, paper by Lorenzo Massa and colleagues, um, where they talk about different perspectives on the business model. So perspective still, still suggests in a certain way it's something that's uh, conceptually removed. So we're looking at it through a certain lens and we're, we're studying it. Uh, but they, I think it's very helpful because they talked about kind of the cognitive or linguistic schemers. Type of ideas. So the business model is not only something um, that uh, is, is like theoretically removed, it's something that people actually use in their day-to-day their -day language. Um, so for instance, Grayson Bakery that um, we're going to talk about a little bit later, um, they're talking, uh, they're, they're saying, um, well, we're not, we're not baking brownies, uh, sorry, we're not, we're not hiring people to bake brownies, but we're baking brownies to hire people. So this is just a very uh, simple tagline, this slogan, this, this linguistic schema, as, as um, they would call it in this paper, in a nutshell explains the business model. And this is something that exists in the company. That's something that you hear. This is something that people externalize when you ask them about what they think their business model is. So it exists in the, in the, body, uh, in, in the body and head in a certain way, in the mind of people, and therefore it's embodied in people. Um, then we do have, of course, the ones we know. So we've got kind of formal, often more conceptual representations of how a firm functions. So the business model canvas probably being the most known of those. Um, but then they're saying, well, we also have those as attributes of real firms. So those are actually things um, that are being done. Um, and, and they're referring to this activity systems perspective on business models. Um, so uh, Zot and colleagues, for instance, talk about uh, talking about what are the typical activities of an airline business model, in this case, a low-cost airline business model. Um, so, and then I think, uh, so then, then we've got uh, Anthony saying here. So, 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 so Oliver, just, just to, before you move yeah. off, I mean, what, what's yeah. coming up for me here is, is a point that uh, uh, Russ Acoff and, and one of his students, um, Jamshid, um, I always mispronounce his surname, Gaj uh made, which is um, organizations are multi-minded purposeful systems. And mm -hmm. uh, which talks to, to what the, social, the sociologists have always understood, which is organizations are socially co-constructed. Yeah. Um, and, and so- did you, did, you, did you say that was Sylvia Girardi, is that right? Uh, Jamshid Gajaharadi. Okay. He, he, okay. He, uh, because I'm working with somebody called Sylvia Girardi, so I was just wondering, but no, there's somebody else, yeah. No, no, diff different person. But, but the, the, the point here is, what this is reminding me about is that um, if, if that is correct, that, that organizations only exist when more than one pe person believes that they do, mm -hmm. right? It, it's like money, right? If, I, if, if you and I believe this piece of paper is worth something, right. it's worth something. If, it's, if, if one right. of us doesn't, it's not worth anything at all. So if, right, if that's yeah. true, then from an empirical perspective, there isn't a real thing about an organization because it's all just mm -hmm. in our minds. Right. And that's, that's exactly why I'm, why I'm trying to evoke those, those kind of rather philosophical questions, because if, uh, if, we're, we're in, uh, if, we, if we're talking about the nature of being, so what, what exists, what is real, right? So there's many different perspectives of it. So what you're talking now, now, about now uh, as, as social construction, so um, if you are in a positive world where you're saying the only real thing is the thing that I can touch and take a picture of in the most extreme sense, um, if you're in that world, probably what's happening in your head is not real. 
But at the same time, if you are in a constructivist world, uh, contact, constructivist here in, in the philosophical sense of saying, okay, well, the world actually is, so in the most extreme position there, nothing exists out there unless you actually have it in your head. So whatever you don't see, whatever you don't think about isn't in existence, right? So this would be the extreme opposite position. Um, so what, what we are trying to do here in, uh, or what I'm trying to get to in this page is actually uh, to bring together those different ideas of reality in, in a very inclusive way and say, okay, well, all of them are real in one way or another. Yeah. So depending on where you stand, you might have a preference for studying uh, or understanding or changing the things that are physically there, that are materialized, or you might have a preference, preference if you're a pragmatist in a philosoph philosophical sense, you're more interested in the activities going on. Or if you're a social constructionist, you're, and uh, maybe from the, coming from the psychology lens, for you, the most real thing is what's happening in people's heads. So, but that doesn't really, if you're inclusive, that doesn't really mean any of those is unreal. It just means that we've got different ways um, of describing reality and different perspectives, different ontologies of what is real. Yeah. So, I, so this I, is kind of... I, think yeah. I, I, I just made the observation in the chat that I think this, is, this speaks to exactly why business models are so seductive because they actually yeah. make something that is fundamentally not real, real, mm -hmm. real in a, in a way, but yet it's not, it's only a model of something that isn't real. Right. It, it might be a real right. model, you know, we might have in our piece of paper, which, make, which makes it quote real in some objective way. Uh, but, right. Right. Uh, but at the same time, it's a model of something that isn't real. Yeah, yeah. So if so, if that piece of paper. So if the, the example before, like all of those nice things we drew on the canvas, they never happen, right? They stay that's in that room. Right. Yeah, Are right. they really real? Yeah. Are they really real? Uh, but at the same time, some people would say, well, at least in that manifestation of that. So so now trying to move away from the the model towards a logic uh, perspective. So that logic of value proposition, creation, exchange, and capture, because then we can actually start saying, so this logic might actually be something that that does exist in different forms. So we could say this logic actually, uh, uh, it does exist already at the point in time that we put it onto that board. But the point is it only exists in that one state. So it, it's real in this room, but it's not real somewhere else yet. So but at the point in time, people start, so going back to the point about uh, strategy implementation. Well, uh, at the point in time, people take this, this thing out of the room. They start talking to others outside. Um, they start explaining people how they could actually make it real, how could they could build activities around it. Once they start uh, multiplying, duplicating in different forms, once they, once they start designing products based on it, um, well, it becomes real in a different way. So there might be at the same time then what I call over here artifacts or materialization, so more things that express it. You might redesign a factory based on the logic by, by which your company is being run. So um, this logic, this, the, what used to be an abstract model, once we translate it into that logic, actually is something that becomes materialized as artifacts, as things, as stuff that's out there. It might become uh, enacted through the activities what we have, so a different way of reality. And of course, at the same time, it becomes something that people have in their heads and that they use in order to organize their mind worlds around. Yeah. So this, this is the basic idea I would like to pitch to you guys to start thinking about um, those kind of real parts of what the business model could be. If you, if you stick to, to Lorenzo uh, Massa and colleagues idea about perspectives, this is ways how you can experience, how you can see it, and then of course also can change what it is. But at the same time, I'm actually trying to, to move on one further level towards reality and saying those are different states, just, just like uh, what we saw in, uh, the water example. So in a certain way, uh, this logic that we have, which is not a model anymore, but actually a logic that exists in reality, well, it could be in people's heads, it could be at the same time materialized in artifacts, and it could be uh, enacted as activities. So it becomes real through those different states of, of what the business model could be. Um, Oliver, Simon has a, a yeah. comment. Yes, please, please jump in anytime. And pl please feel free to interrupt me anytime because I might not see the, the chat. Go ahead, Simon. You're on mute. Yeah, I actually graduated from Nottingham University in um, oh, psychology, yeah. especially with a focus on cognitive psychology. Um, yes. I really like this particular model because in, in the comment section, we work with strategy and strategy execution. And we had one mm -hmm. case where the senior leaders just wanted to communicate a strategic map. And I said, 
no, people in across the you know people wanted the senior leaders wanted to communicate this across the whole organisation, the whole hospital, and I just said people really are not going to understand what a strategic map is. So in terms of your comment about what well, you've got to yeah. consider cognition, artifacts and activities, we use storytelling and gamification, yeah. which really honors, you know, the lived experience of each and every person. And when you use things like storytelling, gamification, you really take people into the business model in a way that honors their intelligence honors their yeah. background and you don't have to lose any complexity or detail it's just you're right. working with their experience of the re of the world right right that they don't come from a business background but these are intelligent people they can can yeah. contribute to the, the development of the strategy yeah and and i think that also thanks a lot for for that comment very helpful i think and also i think it um relates back to this this kind of, uh, the, the, not only the question like how, how does it uh, manifest, how, how is it out there, so how is it real, but also how do you change from one state to another? So it's for, for some people, uh, it, to make it make it real air, if you want, <laughs> horrible, that's a German, German person even trying to make English wrong, sound more wrong. Anyway, um, so, so to make it more real, um, you, you might actually have to move between those different states uh, because you, you, of course, you want the, the, the kind of representations, the, 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 the kind of strategic map in this case, to look very much like what's enacted out there, what, to look like the activities. And you want this to, con to be consistent with, the, with what people have in their heads, ideally, right? So you're, you're searching for consistency between those different states of what it is. Um, and um, so, so I think that's, for me, that's one of the, the, the main tasks of uh, business model implementation, if you want, want to keep using that, that language, or business model execution, to actually make sure that those states co correspond to each other, that they do align. But it also has quite a powerful point for uh, changing business models, because it means that if you do change one of those states, the other ones, they, they're very likely to change as well, because they are connected. They are the same thing. So that they're different in, at one point in time doesn't mean that they cannot um, actually move and become the same because one powerful change has happened in one of them. Yeah. I see there's a lot of activity going on. I see Simon nodding. So probably you want to, want to join, uh, join back in, jump back in. Yeah. And I really like this because we, we shifted a company from doing, uh, having a communication session with all the senior directors on a stage telling people what the strategic map was from the next five years into a storytelling and gamification experience. And this created new feedback loops. And for the very first time, you had senior directors listening to everyone mm -hmm. at every level of the organization. And because right. of that, the actual strategy started to change in ways in which yeah. they hadn't really previously expected because there was this new type of listening. So yeah, I, I like yeah. the changes of matter, uh, metaphor. Yeah, yeah, excellent. And and also, I, so I've seen it happening uh, uh, as well in in, in a past um, uh, kind of past engagement with with one business where actually those metaphors were the ones that without me uh, having any interference there, I was just a passive observer. I actually saw how the the business model of that that huge organization started changing just because of one metaphor. And the metaphor they were they were using was to say. Uh, we're using our scale for good. Um, so they, they they have a scale-based business model, being a huge retailer, uh, and then then saying actually we're using our scale, which is the essence of their business model for good. Then and and the metaphor that traveled throughout the business, um, they actually incrementally, but 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 very pervasively throughout the whole organization started uh, uh, becoming a more responsible organization, which. Um, is something that people might not even have understood as being a type of business model change. But as that met metaphor was so closely related to, to who they are as a business and, and what everything they do was based on, um, that actually had a huge Im impact. So I, uh, I, I perfectly buy into your point of saying, okay, if we just, if, and, and I'm reinterpreting it here, hopefully that's, a, that's an adequate re reinterpretation. So if we actually able to be those business model chemists, if we're able to, to play with those different states of the business model and find out which is the one that actually can most impactfully change the business model right now, I think that's a very, very powerful point 
um, theoretically, but even more powerful, more powerful point uh, practically. If you think about becoming business model chemists or alchemists who are, who are able to change those state, those different states of matter from one to another. Yeah. So, so, so Oliver, let, let, let me let me go very practical here just for for a second. Yes. Bill, what yes. we've done and Simon have been trying to. So, one of the could, could you flip back to your your free road yeah. chart that has cognition? Yes. This one. So, um, it, if we say that the that a, a business model canvas somehow tries to represent. Um, more of the, the bottom two rows, the artifacts and the activities. Yeah. Um, when you respond to the questions that a canvas asks and you write things on post-it notes, it, it tends yeah. to be talking about things that are towards the bottom. But then when you tell a story, um, mm -hmm. that's when you're linking those, those elements together um, through cognition. Um, yes. And that process, which if I, use your other slide of the different states of water is kind of like, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's almost like the story is the gas and, and the other two are solid and liquid. And what, what we're, what's been very hard to communicate to people in a very practical way is what the process of sublimation and evaporation is. Mm -hmm. So um, people can do it intuitively. But, but how do you unpack that process um, so that they can do it reliably and consistently? And, mm. and this, this is an extremely practical challenge that we face as, yes. uh, as business modelers. So this is very interesting. Yeah. Very and this is also because very much. So I think this is also why this ontology question is so, so important because yeah. when we talk about ontology in the classical uh, sense that, that, that you've done and that, uh, that Alex also started doing back then, you get, you, get the, you get the kind of static parts. So you get the building blocks, right? That's literally what you call them. But you are, in a certain way, I think you're distracting a little bit from the question about how do you actually move between them? So what are the processes uh, of, of change in between? And, and going that step back, I think, leads us to exactly this question that, that you're asking. So what are, those, what are the processes actually that, that are happening on those arrows, right? So how do you move from one to another? How do you make sure that the, that the canvas becomes something that's, that's enacted? How do you make sure that the canvas uh, uh, correctly interprets what people have in their heads? Or how do you use the canvas in order to start changing what people have in their heads so that they start enacting it? So this is one of the very interesting things that, that you lose in the move from the ontologies to mm -hmm. the canvases. So in the ontologies, you don't only have nouns, you have verbs that link the nouns right. together, which are the lines between the boxes in the ontologies. But the, yeah. and the, the lines here are not labeled, but in the deep version of this, uh, and in last folders, the lines are all labeled in both directions and they're labeled with verbs. So right. the, um, the, the problem with the visual representation of, on the canvas is you lose all the verbs. The verbs yeah. are subdued into the physical placement of the nouns next to each other. But unless you go looking, you can't see the verbs. And we've not yet found, um, I mean, Osterwalder, to our knowledge, has not done this. And, and we have not yet had the time to try. Um, how do you, um, how, how can you help people get their heads around the verbs um, yeah. that link the boxes together? Um, yeah. Hi, Anthony, can I make a quick comment? Well, um, one of our projects right now is using the Flourishing Business Canvas with um, a bank, you know, the balance scorecard methodology for a not-for-profit charity. And the, the strategic map that we're helping to create, the verbs are explicit. Have you used verbs in that way? And this is where you connect the verbs uh, because it really helps people to uh, understand the activities being discussed. So, so Simon, I, that, that sounds fascinating. And, and I look forward to your future presentation on, on this case study that you're developing uh, either to this group or, or your fellow first explorers for Flourishing Business Canvas. I think that would be tremendous. Yeah, yeah, we did do that. But I was just wondering if, if you guys um, had connected the verbs with the uh, Flourishing Canvas in this way. Um, from what you've said, no. 
because the other thing is um, just in terms of how we can help help people in organisations, it's it's not a natural. I would I had this isn't a scientific thing; it's an observational thing. But it, we've noticed that it's not natural for people to express things in terms of verbs. So we have to kind of help them say, look, here's a statement in the strategic map. Try and um, articulate this as a verb first. And it, it really helps people. It's a really, really positive activity in helping people mm -hmm. think deeply about um, how you link all these different parts together and the views. Great. And once again, it's also an ontological point. So it's it's uh, the like if you think about the the, the very basic nature of being is uh, is being things or is being processes. So is it stuff that's out there or is it is it what's happening? So this kind of very very strong underlying question of ontology of what, what reality is, I think, is one that that kind of manifests in, in, in how you describe it as well. So do, so it appears from what you say that people are more more prone to to understand uh, reality as things out there but if you actually if you actually give them that kind of crutch of saying use verbs to describe it they start describing the processes which i think is quite helpful and quite an interesting experiment and pragmatically probably very uh, very valuable yeah and i good, think yeah. um, especially when we bring maria in because maria is uh, my wife is a specialist in yeah. balance scorecard and worked with Kaplan and norton so yeah actually yeah. we could you know, build on this um, excellent presentation and talk about that side of things. Yeah. yeah. But as I said, I don't want to take um, away, you know, at least focus on No, that's, that's great. I'm, I'm very much, I mean, I'm... Yeah. In this yeah. Strategic. No, it's a great learning for me as well, because, um, so, um, uh, Lorenzo Massa and I, we, uh, we, we stuck heads, heads together a couple of weeks ago. He, he came here for a week and uh, we had really good conversations and we we're trying to um, go deeper into exactly those connections between um, th those different states and trying to find out more about what are actually the processes uh, of moving from one state to another and then of course implications for how you can affect change in practice, practice. so it's not about a, a theoretical exercise merely. Um, so having all of those inputs and very practical points from you folks on, on how you actually make that change happen, that's, that's immensely helpful, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that, yeah. Good. Um, so, um, so, so let me move one one step further. So we know all that stuff already, and from the discussion, I get the idea that you uh, um, that that you guys actually have quite a good, not only theoretical but practical capture of what that actually means. So, um, if you want to put it into a similar form of uh, of uh, kind of the H two O molecular model that we looked at before, well, um, the business model, what it is, what it what its ontology, what it is on an underlying level, could look something like this. So we would have that logic, which we have in the middle, which manifests or which becomes real in certain, certain forms. So it might be embodied in people as cognition, but it might also be embodied in a, in, uh, in a kind of deeper way in terms of their, um, their, their habits, the way how they typically do business, um, the, uh, uh, not, not even the explicit um, cognition they're aware of, but the implicit uh, uh, kind of underlying schemes of, of, of how they think and behave, cognitive schemata and so on. So I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not very good expressing those things theoretically, but it's about everything that's going on in your head in a certain way and how it connects to who you are and how you behave in a business. And this then, of course, uh, very closely connects to the enacted activities of the business itself, so the activity system that um, is, uh, is living, that's going on um, um, all the time. Um, but also at the same time, we do have it manifest, become real as artifacts. And then, of course, we do have those um, different connections between them. So going both ways, how do activities actually become artifacts? So you could take pictures of what you're doing. Uh, you could have uh, more ki kind of technical quantitative ways of measuring what you're doing. Uh, but also you're, you're interested in how do those artifacts actually become something as cognition and how does cognition materialize an artifact? So design process, for instance, would be on that area up there, going back and forth, forth between artifacts and between what people have in their heads. Um, or you could also uh, think about how um, do activities actually become embodied? So how do the things that you do in a business change the way you think? Um, so just giving examples, this is not, not meant to be an exclusive list, but this is trying to start a process of finding out how do we, how can we actually move between those different states of the business model? But also it, it, um, 
comes to a very interesting point about what is this thing in the middle actually? What, what is this logic? Does it exist independently from, from those different states? Or um, is it something that is only there if any of those states is there? Um, and at the same time, which one is the, the, the real formula? Which one is the, the real logic that is enacted? Is it the one that's thought or is it the one that's materialized or is it the one that's, that's actually lived and enacted? Um, so that's kind of a mind-boggling thing, and I'm putting that out as a question. I don't have an answer for that. That uh, Lorenz and I, we had a very intense session the other day where, where he was sitting like this and, and going like, ooh, I, I don't really know what to think about this. <laughs> um, so, so it's quite interesting to think about, uh, if, we, if we ask this question, what is the logic, what is the value logic of the business? Does it actually, in which one is the true one? If there's a difference between what we have on the canvas and the things we do, and if this is different once again in how how the, how people think about the value logic of the business, which one is the one that's really true, so, or is there a true one? So, yeah. so, well, well I, I I I think your your last point there, Oliver, is is perhaps hinting at the way I would uh, start to to wrestle with this, which is, of course, there is no one truth. Uh, yeah. But but what I wonder is. If viability is P, C, subscript R, E, and, and we take the C, subscript A out of the picture and just to say yeah. that is viability, what if viability was the emergent property of mm -hmm. all three states mediated through those variables? Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, if, if you if you only have a cognitive view of the organization and it has no artifacts and it has no activities, it's not yeah. viable. You know, if the organization has activities but it has no story and it has no artifacts, it's not viable. I, I mean, I can do the logic that way around, I think, for, in all three cases. So I, I think this is, yeah. this, this is very tantalizingly um, interesting. So Simon, I'm really curious, when, when you did your presentation to us on the, on the philosophical background to, to your work, um, my gut's telling me this is quite related to what you were thinking about. It's also quite related. So we do have a, the, the new group that's just joining us in the, in the SSBMG is um, uh, they're community psychologists. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, it's Manuel Rima presented to us last month. Now, he wasn't talking about this type of philosophical perspective on psychology, but I suspect uh, it's going to be really interesting to get his perspective on this. Simon, yeah. what, what, how, how do you see this relating to your philosophical approach in holonomics? Yeah, I think the, the way we approach it, we have a very, uh, we use like hermeneutics as well, and we have a concept of wholeness, a dynamic notion of wholeness. And the mm -hmm. way we work is that the way I kind of explain it is that often um, you don't ask an architect to go into his technical knowledge or her technical knowledge about material design and that you folk, the, the architect will focus on what it is that they're building and what they, the experience will be for the client. So the way we work is that we're highly influenced by phenomenology and hermeneutics, but we don't talk about this when we're working with clients. We, yeah. we, what we're doing is we're taking process and systemic methodologies like balanced scorecard and taking a way in which it's into a much deeper ontological realm for our holonomics approach. Um, again, I'm, I'm conscious of time in terms of how, how we're explained, but this is very, very um, in line and in sync with how we work. And the, mm. our, our um, approach is to say, there's no need to criticize things like balanced scorecard. In fact, balanced scorecard is of its time. It's almost as if its time has now arrived. It's just that many people fail to see its systemic nature. And that's because they have quite a mechanistic understanding of systems thinking or no systems thinking at all. So we work in quite radically different ways to take people into this experiential realm and the other thing we connect, so we connect balance scorecard, uh, strategic maps with the flourishing canvas, with the customer experience. And we bring all of those three elements together. And that's, so, you know, we, we always talk about 
where is the soul of the organization articulated? Who experiences it? And it's not just about paying customers or consumers. No, the concept is much, much deeper. And that's where, you know, the flourishing canvas really comes in. So, you know, we're working with the flourishing canvas with many uh, B2B companies. Many, we're working in the extractive industry and are really helping to expand people's consciousness inside these levels of organizations so they can really rethink what they're doing and their connections not just with our business customers but with uh, stakeholders and of course a wider uh, community because I'm just you know here in Brazil we've had many uh, well-known environmental catastrophes in the last couple of years and these catastrophes are continuing so you know we're, we're really being listened to this particular I'm also very cognizant, uh, Simon and Oliver, that we, we've got um, Bruno Latour's Actor Network Theory uh, reference here from, from Oliver's 2018 paper. And, uh, I was just about to, to talk about that for a different reason, but, but great that you, you lead into it, yeah. Yeah, because this, this idea that, that artifacts have agency um, is, is, a, is a very important idea in this whole, whole space. Um, yeah. And um, I, I think, it, again, it talks to the, the, the hermeneutic nature very, very strongly, and it, it gives an explanatory framework. I, I'm certainly not a Bruno Latour expert, but Peter Jones, one of the co-founders of this group, who I'm very sorry isn't here today, I've just texted him to say he has to watch this and, and give us some feedback. Um, but he, he would be all over this from that perspective, I, I, I know. Yeah. I just put in the chat uh, 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 a hypothesis for you to have a think about, um, which you can do later. Anyway, back to, back to you, Oliver. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 we also would like you to, uh, to get through the rest of your exciting ideas. So I, I, I will try, I will try, yeah. You've got about 10 minutes left. Let, let's see, that's a challenge, but... Um, uh, Simon, just just one one uh, small remark. So, so in this this long range planning paper that um, that Anthony just mentioned, uh, one of the central artifacts that actually brought responsibility and sustainability um, into that organization was the balanced scorecard. So, so you might find it interesting to have a look at how how it happened in this case as well. So, just as a as a reference down there. So, this is the, the 2018 one, which which is on that slide. Um, so, let me get practical then. I and. Uh, it's very typical, right? Academics are talking uh, like ninety percent of the time about theoretical stuff, and then then the practical is in the last ten minutes. Anyway, so this is just like different ways of representing what we just talked about. So I think that's relatively um, straightforward. So this is the more kind of extensive version uh, that we have in that same paper as well. If you want to uh, think about how how you move between those different states, so it's not very well de developed yet, but it's got kind of pointers at what you could look into how you move from one state to another. Um, so then, then in terms of examples, so I mentioned this retail company a couple of times already. So just to give you an idea about, um, in, so, so we did over 100 interviews with them. Um, and, I, and one of the things I asked everybody in there was, so, so what's your business model? What does it look like? And uh, so there were very intriguing different answers coming out of it. So if you stay in the cognitive side, so this person called Anna, and that's an that's a alias, of course, says, well, it's your how-to-do guide. So this is kind of what we have in our heads while we do things. Yeah? So this is our business model. And uh, then at the same time, Earl down there was saying, well, that's clear. It's buy, move, and sell. That's the things we do. So it's the activities. Uh, and then Nancy up there was saying, well, it's that picture in the annual report. So um, an artifact quite clearly. But then in the middle, uh, Erica, very interesting, she was saying, well, it's the DNA of the company, so it's in a certain way, it's the kind of basic building blocks, the underlying logic, the, the thing that's inside everything that we are and that we do. So that's very close to the notion of it being the, the logic that we talked about before. Um, and then in, 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 in there, we saw that this notion of being responsible, um, like a big initiative that they started, actually became part of all of those different parts of how they're the, the business model um, became real in their company. So quite interesting 
uh, case really. And then there's something that's not uh, been published yet, but, but that we're in the process of publishing. Um, so this is this company called Allsafe in uh, southern Germany. Um, they're doing fixtures. So fixtures being uh, kind of devices that you put into uh, onto planes, uh, well, sometimes spaceships even, and um, uh, generally transport in order to, uh, to hold your load in place, whatever your load might be. So a very kind of technical type of business. But um, the, the, uh, the, the new owner and at the same time CEO of the business, when he took it over uh, about 10 years ago, actually came in with this kind of humanistic lens. So he wanted to reorganize that business so that it was good uh, first and foremost for the people working in it. So he moved from a kind of customer-centric perspective to an employee Centric perspective. So his idea was about human flourishing. So helping people to uh, be the best version of themselves in that business and to be a, a uh, to create a business that's uh, that's based on humanistic principles. So and again, to, there's a lot to go into uh, much deeper. But once again, the question how it materialized. So if you look on on the left hand side up here, so this is the book the founder of the company uh, wrote. So I, I think the picture is very telling. So basically, he's got a person there. Um, and the head is missing, but the point is really that this philosophy, this logic of um, um, of, of managing the business for the, the, the welfare, for the for the flourishing of people, this is what is in the head of people uh, in that business. And then down here we've got uh, a picture of uh, people's profiles as they were, were glued to the wall in the production facilities, where people describe their philosophy of how this business should should be run. Uh, and what they can what they can contribute to it. So once again, kind of a, kind of gives a glimpse of what's going, how the business model becomes part of uh, uh, people's cognition. And then on the right hand side, we have um, the production facilities. If you look in the back, so one of the um, main points when they moved into the new location was to say, well, actually, part of this humanistic thinking is kind of very egalitarian thinking of we're all alike, we're all the same, we're we're we are all human beings. So it doesn't make sense to have a physical separation as well. And typically production facilities in that industry are ground level. Uh, people work in the factory. Um, uh, first, first level, uh, first story up is uh, the, the kind of uh, administrative people who wear suits. Um, and they actively said, okay, no, we actually want to represent this, this egalitarian idea of we're all human people, human beings. We're all alike and we're all the same. Um, there shouldn't be any hierarchies. They translated that into the building and made it a one-story building where everybody's on the same floor. You, you might say that's a little bit silly and it's a very, very simple thing, but it was a, an active, deliberate decision to actually materialize this kind of humanistic thinking, even in the production facility and in the architecture. Um, and then down there, we do have a couple of pictures of uh, the activities. Um, so once again, um, for instance, the way meetings are done, the, the one in the middle, everybody's just standing up in the middle of uh, one of the pr production halls and um, well actually the people working in administration are, are just standing intermingled with with ev everybody else working in production everybody has a voice everybody can speak up everybody is uh, at the forefront of what's happening and uh, including the ceo just standing as as part of the group there um, so you see how things are organized how, how things are practiced how, how activities are implemented once again represents that uh, that idea yeah. And then Simon's saying, uh, we offer a range of materials to allow people to create uh, what, they, what they are visualizing. Uh, Lego play. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I lo love Lego methodologies in class as well. That's a kind of slightly different topic, but yeah. Nice. Um, so that's another example. I'm just trying to, I, I do rush through them right now a little bit, just, just to see if maybe we still can get like, maybe two minutes um, of discussion or, or comments at the end out of it. So this is the Grayston example. Once again, um, so their, their idea is, um, and, and the very, very um, reason and origin of this business is to try to find out how to hire people and give them a subsistence uh, in the community of Yonkers, close to uh, New York City. Um, so so they're doing brownies, baking brownies, uh, but they're also running a foundation at the same time, and all the profits if of the, uh, the bakery actually go into the foundation in order to um, uh, to improve still the community life also in different ways. 
And once again, you see the people on the left-hand side. So you see, for instance, uh, those two Buddhist monks down there. One of them is the founder of the company, uh, um, Ronnie Glassman. And then we do have uh, kind of when uh, when uh, like-minded people meet. Well, this 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 in here is actually the faces of myself and my colleague Ruth who are doing research, who are doing research there. But originally, those were the faces of. Uh, uh, of course, the Ben and Jerry's founders. But then what happened was that Bernie Glassman with his idea about um, social impact um, through business was very, uh, met those two guys and, and very closely connected to what they were doing, which was uh, one of the very first large scale contracts that uh, Grayson Bakery had with uh, Ben and Jerry's. So you, you see, it's, it's very much about, about the, the kind of philosophy, the logic of doing business in people's heads, but it's also about how it materialized and Grayson's, for instance, in their logo. So they call it the Grayson Mandala part of it. So you see that, that um, this, this kind of interlinked uh, thing right in the middle, I understand, represents how the foundation and how the, the bakery work together. So you get the logic, that hybrid logic, also materialized in their logo. You've got the, uh, uh, the foundation uh, building down there and also you do have um, then the activities of the company and both of them would be very hands-on actually doing the baking but at the same time um, also trying to pass on this idea of uh, open hiring to other businesses and help other businesses to, to get this activity system going somewhere else as well to pass on this open hiring business models to, uh, model to other uh, places as well. Um, so in all of all of this is still like on a rather static level. If you think about more pragmatically, how can we actually start changing what's out there? Um, this is something I just uh, started drafting up yesterday. So sorry for the very rudimentary state it is in a uh, different uh, uh, product that we uh, sorry different um, research project that we're doing right now on Chinese bike sharing. So that's happening right in front of. Uh, so I can actually see it from up here right now happening. Um, where, you, where, where I was trying to find out how did the, the bike sharing business model actually change over the last couple of years because it was just five years ago that, that the city of Ningbo here implemented a public bike sharing model. But then at the same time, this public bike sharing very, very quickly was overtaken by those private uh, dockless bike sharing companies. So Ofo and Mobike and so on. Many of them have gone abroad and are public uh, 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 all over the world right now as well. But apparently this dockless uh, normal uh, kind of non-e-bike sharing now once again is, is uh, 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 receiving kind of a fundamental shift towards private e-bike sharing with a completely bit different business model once again. So uh, unfortunately we don't have time to go too deeply into this but uh, just to give you an idea about how those different states of cognition artifacts activities and how business model change in this example actually initiated started in one of the states but then spread through the other ones as well. Um, so I think the message here is to, to think about if we want to change business models, we might also very pragmatically start thinking about which of those states can be used in order to impact change uh, throughout the other states as well. Yeah. So business model innovation, I think, is interesting here. But also if we're in the, founder, uh, in the founding process of a new business, this is the research project of uh, Xuan Ye, who I, I just mentioned before, my PhD student. Um, who's interested in how the business model actually changes through the startup process and how in different stages the different um, uh, uh, manifestations of the business model change as well. Um, so just to conclude, because I know we are probably right on time, we still might have a minute. So the point is to say, well, uh, the core of the business model, if you move from the, the model towards a logic, we do have those proposition, creation, exchange, and, and capture. Uh, which then might uh, manifest in different states. So this, this, those different states that we looked before are in a certain way this value logic. Um, and then if you're interested in um, how do business models actually change, well, we might well, we, we cannot directly touch this value logic because this is something that somewhere floats in the air between those different states. We have to start stay changing uh, one or several of those states in order to change the overall value logic, the logic of how a business uh, um, uh, has a or the value proposition, the creation, exchange, and capture um, of a particular business. So this is kind of the high-level um, overview, and I apologize for rushing through that uh, last bit, but I thought it was important to actually have um, seen all of that in order to uh, to keep the conversation going, maybe just a little bit right now, and hopefully for for a longer time afterwards. That's where I shut up. Thank you very much, Oliver. Um, so um, I just a couple of closing. Uh, 
comments from from me. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you, Oliver. You, you've um, uh, it's been a little while since we've had a a, um, a, te a technical deep dive uh, as, as such as you and and, and and done in such an exploratory way. Um, and, I, and I really um, want to highlight uh, to everybody that this is one of the, the benefits of this community. Um, it's I, I think all of the you've experienced it's not so easy to find a group of people to bounce an idea off that's you know reasonably somewhat developed but is, is still needing further work uh, and to be able to engage in a, in a conversation so uh, this is exactly why we're here um, to be able to, to provide that um, I'm, I'm also delighted that it, it we, we would you were attempting to connect it to practice the whole way through and I think that's also very important for many people on this call um, so uh, yeah, th thank you, Oliver. That was that was tremendous. And uh, well, thank, uh, thank you so much for, for giving me that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. That's that's. I mean, this is this is you know the, the members of the group. This group is by its members for its members, and I think uh, we, we we've amply demonstrated that that value co-creation uh, today. Um, uh, I just wanted to add. Uh, Peter Jones uh, apologizes for not being able to attend. He, he's uh, been on a pretty intensive travelling today, and, and and said that he had read the. The, uh, the pitch for the article and, and had guessed that uh, this is where you might take things and uh, mm. uh, was, uh, was sorry not to be able to, uh, uh, to, to be able to join, but I wanted you to share, share that. Um, in terms of um, our presentation next month, um, just to close on that, uh, we have uh, two possible uh, presentations and I don't yet know which one it's going to be. Uh, so uh, on two completely different topics, uh, one is by uh, our members from the Department of Environment and Land Use Planning in the Flemish government in Belgium, uh, who have been doing some fascinating research on why do green business models not stick? Why, why are people not been adopting them? And what policy interventions they could adopt that might change that, um, including some workshops, uh, including exploring how business modeling and a, and a better business modeling tool like the Flourishing Business Canvas uh, might, might enable um, better policy outcomes. So that's one possible presentation for next month. And if it's not met next month, it'll be uh, later in the summer. Um, uh, and the other presentation is, um, many of you know that uh, uh, along with the Flourishing Business Canvas, there is also now a method for its use with existing organizations to do strategy development. And uh, there's a new book coming out, uh, uh, edited by one of our members, uh, Thomas Wunder on uh, uh, rethinking strategy for impact, um, and that book is uh, has chapters in it from many, many of our members. And so we may feature one of those chapters next month, or we may feature the book next month. Uh, still working out the, the details. So uh, there's a there's a the few possibilities that will emerge over the coming months. I think is perhaps the, the right way to think about it. So uh, thank you again, Oliver. Thank you all for joining in. Thank and you, everybody. Uh, and uh, yeah, great, great, uh, great meeting. Super yeah, happy. Thanks, Oliver. It was excellent. Cheers. When, when you've done some more thinking, Oliver, don't hesitate and come back and tell us tell us about it. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that because I was a little bit worried that it might be a little bit too uh, too theoretical. But uh, I get from the discussions that it's actually something that that does connect to to what many of of you guys are doing. So so thanks a lot for for that input as well. Absolutely, and hopefully see you in Berlin. Yes, and yes, I will be there. I will be there, uh, definitely. I and several other people will be there uh, in Berlin. Oh, great, yeah. Yeah, let's connect. That would be great. All right. See, see you All soon. Right. See you guys then. Bye-bye. See you next, this, this time next month. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Nicole. Oliver? There's, there's my mic again. Yeah. Hello. Oh, hey. Um, do you have a second? I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so, from, from what I understand, um, so in terms of, of the chemistry and, and what you're talking about and the cognition mm -hmm. aspect of it, do you see that as, like, as, if I'm understanding that correctly, like, do you see that as the evolution of the business, like, uh, what is essentially missing? Like in terms of the ability to put that cognition or to, to conceptualize that cognition into the business model? 
There, there is, um, so there's a couple of articles that, that start thinking about it in terms of cognition, but there's an, not a lot out there yet. So, right. um, uh, so I think that's, that's something that's actually quite interesting to explore. So, so particularly if you are, if you're doing a PhD right now, who knows, maybe you're at some point in time, you might drift towards that direction. My, my, uh, both of my PhD students, they're, they're, they're attaching to, uh, connecting to the cognition part now as well. So they're trying to find out how, um, does the business model actually become something that's in people's heads and how, how do people then again reshape it based on what they have in their heads? So yeah, that's, that's quite an interesting one. And there's not a lot out there yet. Well, it's, it's sort of interesting, right? Cause this, this connection between sustainability, right? Like mm -hmm. where I think they were talking about that stickiness of why aren't these yeah. companies flipping and yeah. you know, the idea of the really, really key point, I think that that really resonated for me was this idea of the mechanistic approach to strategy. And not mm -hmm. recognizing that it's a cognition approach as well, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. sort of like where where Capra is sort of talking. And it's sort of fascinating to me that um, you know, sort of when you approach it from a cognition standpoint, where it's the collectiveness of everybody's mm -hmm. thoughts, like how do you capture like that? That's something that's fascinating to me is trying to capture that in the tools that yeah. we have, right? Like even our system yeah. tools yeah. don't capture yeah. a level of like they capture sort of community and ecology, but they don't capture if you were to overlay that onto a mm. cognitive body which yeah, i think right, is right. is very interesting yeah. so i just was yeah. sort of wondering if that was sort of one of the like areas that you were sort of where your research might eventually go is this idea that could you pattern cognition into the model yeah yeah i'm, I'm even before the the patterning it in part, I, I think there's a very practical question about how do you get things out of people's heads into uh, in, in, into a shareable format in a certain way, because much of it is implicit, it is tacit, it's not something that people actively know. Right. Um, and, and even if they knew, um, if you're doing, an, so you've got all of those things, if you're doing interviews like um, the, the, all the type of different biases you can get and why people don't exactly say the, the, the way how they think the world. So uh, it's, it's also on, on a methods level, it's really, really tricky. Um, and that's probably why, why people have tended to, to mostly talk about the, mostly about the activities part because you can observe it and, uh, right. and often about the devices part because you, you see the devices, you, you have them and cognition is something you cannot just see. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's sort of. So I'm not really answering questions. I'm just saying it's difficult, but it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, no, it, it, and I think it was interesting that you used a, chemi a, a chemical model, right? So you're sort yeah. of getting into a replication and duplicate, like that, that, yeah. that, you know, the translation of energy, right? And yeah, so if, yeah. if you were to take your model and say, okay, I'm going to make a molecule now, like, like what you're saying, like, mm -hmm. well, what is, like, I almost wonder if, if it's something like, you know, the chakras on a body sort of talk a little about like they're big sort of transmitters of that energy. And I'm wondering if yeah, anyway, yeah. I'm just riffing, I just don't find it very interesting. And I, when I was reading it, that idea that mm. cognition maybe is the trans that translation of energy into sort of a vibration. Yeah. yeah. Just a vibrational form. Very right? interesting, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, um, Nicola, have you, have you uh, in the last, uh, I, Sorry, Sorry. I, said, I, was, like, I was like, I want to talk. Just, Hold on. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask a question. So, you, 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 so, so to link energy and cognition, have, have both of you seen the recent work, and I'm going to forget his name, I can find it easily enough though. Uh, he's a British um, neuro, I want to say neurobiologist, I think. So, so he's, he's interested in the neurochemistry in the brain. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, he's, he seems to be linking it to um, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which of course is a purely f physical um, mm -hmm. a, a way of explaining how st structure and order emerges from chaos, mm -hmm. which of course is, is antithetical to the, the um, second law of thermodynamics. Um, and um, so, he is, he is making the link that you've just hypothesized, Nicole, and he seems to be getting evidence to suggest mm -hmm. that cognition is actually an expression of the, um, of non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Um, and, 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 and certainly others, pe people like Alan Tater and Holmes, Hoekstra in Supply Side Sustainability have already made the argument that social structures like organizations are definitely an expression of, um, um, structure emerging from chaos uh, through processes of non-equilibrium thermodynamics. 
Um, I've, I've found a video by this guy. He, he's extremely dry. He, I think, I, I think, I, I think actually he was um, the way I heard about him recently is um, uh, he, he had an article uh, about him in Wired of all places. Um, let me see. Uh, see so, if I can find it. So one of the questions I I challenge Stephen on in one of our second last question questions is this idea of so that, so you, like this is really fascinating on the model right so we were talking about strategy from the three horizons model and then i said well so i, I guess my question was is in panarchy right the panarchy model really talks about the translation of energy from a slower moving system like a faster slower moving system and then when you overlay sort of what you're talking about like this idea that you have artifacts and you've got the cognition like mm. my question is, is what drives the shift, right? So when, and, and so that's the fascination that I find in is, is it the mm. cognition that drives the shift, right? Mm -hmm. right? Because you're putting the energy out of the thought and you're actually translating that now into the shift and the model's trying to capture that, right? Or like what, and so what's driving that? So anyways, I don't know, but it was just, mm. it's just, I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. The chemi the chemi yeah and I think it's really, I think it's really a, um, I, th I think this, this kind of metaphor doesn't give a lot of answers, but it, but it raises a lot of questions, which, which I, I was hoping it would be doing. So exactly the type of questions that you're coming up with right now. And my, my own thinking that's reflected in a way of um, trying to think about patterns of, of, of business model change. So I think similar to what you're saying to think, does it start with cognition or does it start with the artifact or does it start in the activity? And I, I assume, I don't know because I haven't done anything empirically on that. I assume that there's different patterns of how business model change happens uh, that starts on either one of those. Mm -hmm. um, so, and so this, this thing I, I just showed very briefly before about um, the, the, the bike sharing here, here in China. Um, so if you see just the, 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 the horizontal yeah. arrows, the red, red arrows that were on there, um, th this, this is where it moves from one business model to another. And in um, those two shifts that I have in there, actually that, that starts on different levels. So it starts once where um, I think it's exactly about the physical one. So all of a sudden we actually do have apps with GPS functioning, which means we don't need uh, fixed docks. We don't need, need stations for bike sharing anymore. So the material aspect, the, uh, the artifact changes first, and then we realize, oh, look, actually now that we do have, we can track where our bikes are. We do, we're not worried about leaving them in particular places. We can actually, through an app, give, give anybody access to, uh, um, to bikes at any time, anywhere. It doesn't really matter anymore. Right. Uh, which then, then, of course, changes the thinking, like the cognitive pattern, how you think about using bike sharing in your head. And it changes also the underlying activity. Because all of a sudden, you also need to have a much more stronger point on deposit because people... so economic deposit because people can leave them anywhere. They can leave them in, the, in a river if they want to. So which, somewhere which we saw in France. Actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which happens, not only in France, <laughs> even in China, where yeah. West cameras everywhere. But this then means that you get, get a deposit, which means you have to do something with the deposit. All of a sudden, what, what wasn't really of concern at all was um, how you actually invest money before it was how, how do you get money in order to buy your bikes. Now it becomes, ooh, I've got an excess of money. I become an investment business all of a sudden. So in the activity parts, um, the business model changed considerably because a the large mm -hmm. part of what they're doing is investing their deposits. Right. So, so you see, like it, it starts at different different levels, but then the next one is really about people saying, "Well, mm, okay, so I like the, sh the sharing idea and the, con the 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 kind of accessibility of it, but I really don't want to pedal um, on a bike through a polluted Chinese city." So the mind, so there there the mindset part of how people use it and how, how people represent it, what, what it rep represents in their heads. In this case, the kind of preferences and the, also the kind of the sensory feeling of does it feel good or bad doing that leads to them saying, well, actually, I want to use my, my e-scooter. Everybody's using private e-scooters anyway. But if I'm on two wheels, I want to be on two wheels where I don't have to pedal. And all of a sudden, the e-bike the, the e sharing comes up. So right. there the kind of the change happens in the cogn cognitive part. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just saying that to say, to say like it, it helps, I think it helps thinking about business model change once again in a different way and understanding better why business model change and then as a consequence also, how can we make business model change? Yeah, well, and I think, it, I think you've hit on a really fascinating point there, whereas it goes back to that conversation that, and I don't know if it was you said that or Simon said that, where the, this idea that we think binary in our modeling, right? Like we don't mm -hmm. recognize that, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on at one point 
and the yeah. tools that we're using to capture that. Like, how do you capture, how do you capture that what you just talked about and put it into a model and say, there's a snapshot of the, the outcome of, of all of this, right? That goes into yeah. the model as opposed to like now looking at it, like you say, from a non-mechanistic systems perspective. Anyways, I just yeah. find it really yeah. fascinating. So I, thank you for, anyway, sorry. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I agree, Nicole. You, 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 we, we obviously didn't get a chance to talk about it, but that last uh, slide that you had, which start to talk about, Mm -hmm. uh, you, what the work your PhD student is doing about how business models mm. change over time. Um, yeah. th this, this aspect, this dynamic aspect is absolutely critical because mm -hmm. to the point Nicole's making, um, we're, we're in practice uh, su suggesting that the only way for somebody to intentionally try to have a strategy that helps create the future that they want, i.e. a flourishing future for their company in an environment and a society that is also has the possibility for flourishing. The only way to do that is by backcasting. And from a, so that means from a business modeling perspective, you actually have to design not only your next business model, which is what typical strategy processes would be talking about. Right. You actually right. have to first design your far future business model and then design your next one in right. light of where you're trying to get to. So, you're the, so if you take that to diagram your student had put together with how mm -hmm. the business model changes over time, now that, that was a representation, I think, of um, an actual evolution over time. But mm -hmm. when you flip that from an actual mode into a design mode, so you're moving from trying yeah. to describe what has happened into trying to design what you would like to happen, what happens is that the sequence of those three models of the modeling changes. So you actually yeah. start with yes, an understanding of where you are, but then you actually jump to the far future to come back into the middle. Yeah. And, uh, and, and th this has some extremely interesting implications, which, which Nicole is now starting to, uh, it was starting yeah. to unpack just, just then. Um, so yeah. I, I, I think there is a, um, so, so when you, when your PhD student gets a, gets a little further through his, his work, Sorry, his work, yeah. her work, their work. His work. Um, well, I mean, there, there's two of them. There's, there's oh, he and there's okay. she. But, 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 no, but I, the, I would really the, encourage the them to share yeah. some of their thinking, yeah. uh, thinking with us. Um, yeah. And uh, that they should, should definitely take a look at this uh, book um, that, um, uh, th this uh, book by Thomas Wunder uh, that's coming out. I think you know Thomas. I do want to say yes, but I'm not... T tell me a, a little bit more about him again. Uh, so he's a strategy prof. He he is the. Uh, oh, oh, sure. No, no. We had we had no. I remember. No, we had, we had lunch together in Chicago. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That, that's right. right. Yes, 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 oh, yes. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So so, so, Tom, so Thomas has managed to get um, uh, Henry Mintzberg to write the introductory chapter to this book, and oh, so I, and it's, yeah. it's going to be featured at AOM in Boston this uh, yeah. in uh, August. So we, yeah. we have a chapter in there, as do quite a few, as does Florian uh, and, and quite a few other yeah, people yeah. in the SFPMG. Um, and um, so backcasting um, and a number of other techniques that have previously not really been employed by strategists at all, yeah. and business modeling being another one, uh, is yeah. now being mainstreamed by what Thomas is doing. And with Mintzberg putting in the introductory chapter, it, it really could uh, reframe the field uh, if, if it yeah. has the impact that we kind of hope it does. Uh, so that book's Great. published um, in uh, later this month or early next month. Uh, well, I remember now, actually, he asked me to do something for it as well. I was just too, uh, too, too busy at this, this time for Shane. Yeah. Okay, no, great. Um, so so uh, the, the other thing I just wanted to connect to here is I just put into the chat um, this uh, video by Carl Friston just to mm -hmm. uh, c connect to something else, Nicole, you were saying earlier. So it's the, uh, the guy's Carl Friston and, and um, uh, he, he, uh, he, as I said, he's a cognitive psychologist, so, uh, sorry, physiologist, yeah. physiologist, biologist. So he, he's talking about Bayesian energy levels in neurons in the brain, but he's relating it to non-equilibrium thermodynamics and in what he calls embodied uh, cognition. Um, and um, so, uh, I, and of course, the reason why I heard about it was because people are wondering whether any of this could inform the design of artificial intelligences, which links very nicely back to an ontology. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I, I, uh, I put the links to the original Wired article and there's a 15 minute video interview with him, which is uh, pretty good. I, I, 
so anyway, I, it's, it's, it's just fascinating how these, these things appear to be fitting together. Well, yeah. so, so here's, the, here's the thing, right? When something transforms, there's a moment, whether it's on the quantum level, that there's a space that happens that's created, right? Where something can get in. And the reason why I say that is because right now in cybersecurity, they're recognizing hackers have figured out how to get in when something translates from a system to a system. So mm -hmm. for instance, in the translation of data, there's a moment, a split second where the hacker can get in and <laughs> blow up the system, right? And they're starting to figure that out now with more sophistication. So my question would be is, even in a business model, at some point there's in that backcasting, there's going to be a translation of energy. Even if it's at the quantum level, there's a metaphor there for being able to make an intervention at the precise mm -hmm. moment in time that will shift all those things you're talking about, right? So you're getting mm -hmm. into almost like a temporal conversation now, right? And strategy, yeah. right? So for instance, like on the three horizons model, they talk about temporal. So in that moment when those horizons collide, there's an opportunity for shift. And the question is, is how does that shift happen? Does it happen the cognition first, mm -hmm. right? And so that's what's fascinating about the allegory you have here is because you're identifying the points in that moment of transition where you can get in and make an, the shift happens even mm -hmm. as at the quantum level. And I know that's like yeah, interesting idea, yeah. crazy ass, whatever, just the grad student here, but like, I was just like, <laughs> But that's the fascinating. Oh, that's the, that's the, the, the kind of very intriguing thoughts that, that are very worth exploring further, I think. Yeah. yeah. But you're seeing this right now in the hacker community. So that's interesting yeah. that, that uh, what's this guy and, and whatever. Because at some point, if we get that sophisticated with computer technology, like even if you think about reproduction and human beings, at some point there has to be a, trans, a translation of when, you know, that when, the, when sort of the, the egg and the sperm hits, there's, a, there's an opening somewhere. Right. So mm -hmm. if artificial intelligence could get in and figure that out before we do, they could actually intervene in that moment. Right. Mm -hmm. They could actually replicate and duplicate that. I, I know that's a weird analogy. Yeah. But, it, but theoretically, well, I, I think it's it's interesting also because um, so it makes me think about the so Anthony mentioned this actor network theory work before and translation is kind of the central process, how they frame how change happens. So they're saying translation is the process where, and, and that, that's what, what, what I'm talking about in this paper that the, mm -hmm. uh, where this whole kind of triangular model, model came from as well, that, that they say basically, well, anyway, I'm going to say how I explained because I don't want to kind of misquote the, the early action network theory guys. So what, what I'm trying to say is that a business model basically is a network of different actors that can be human or, or, or non-human actors, but that doesn't really matter because they're doing everything together anyway. But so, so if it's an actor network, then the way it changes is through translation. Translation means that the logic of one actor is somehow interacting with the logic of another actor and they're talking to each other and trying to make sure that they understand each other, they translate back and forth until their logics are, are, are roughly the same. So this means in this case, if you have an artifact, so if you have the business model canvas as an actor and this business model canvas goes out there with a certain logic, which is different from everybody else's logic, then they engage in translation and you do, you might have at some point in time this, as you said before, that kind of gap in between oh. where, where it's open, right? So where it's neither this one nor that one and where you can ha have big change happening as well. But, but also I, I think it in a certain way, it also challenges um, your point of, of this, this, this gap because that translation doesn't happen in, at the same time because um, this this kind of thing it moves through the organization and it translates to different to different actors at different points in time so there's not this kind of um, kind of co coexistence of that gap at all of those the, between all of those right. actors at the same time but it's kind of sequenced which makes that that opening to be probably not as impactful you could, could just have that opening between two actors in, in, in one translation at one time. But so I think, I think this is, starts to provide a, an explanatory framework for why, um, which, which I don't think we've really had before, which is, you know, Osterwald was, was the one who, who I believe originally said, all a business model truly is, is a common language to enable better conversations. But I'm not, but I'm not sure we've actually had a explanatory framework presented in the literature about why that's true 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think what you've just started to articulate there, Oliver, if I understood you well, is <laughs> an explanatory framework based on this model about why when a group of people get together and they create an artifact, a business model, so they create a model of something that isn't real, the organization, yeah. that only exists in their multiple minds, to use yeah. uh, Gajah Haradi's uh, um, terminology, um, why that actually helps with individual and shared cognition. Mm-hmm. Right? The, the, it's it's yeah. the connection between yeah. those things that's actually being facilitated um, uh, and, and, and it's flowing backwards and forwards. So it's, it's almost like you've got sublimation and you, all, all those three arrows going on. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually yeah. going on through, through that process of business modeling uh, between the various... Yeah. Um, I, I need to go, um, Sorry, but I just yeah. wanted to... I, I just wanted to yes, and yeah, actually, I'm having, yeah. having a, a PhD class later on, which is, uh, I think I'm going to be horrible. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Well, anyway, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate you taking that moment, Oliver, to ask my question. Yeah. Thank very much. It's very interesting. Thanks for, for bringing up that, that question. I think the thought is very interesting, yeah. Um, so so I, I, um, uh, if you want to save the chat, Oliver, we, we will put the chat into the, the folder with your presentation and the recording, but you can also right. save it locally if right. you want to. Uh, there's, there's a little yeah. more button down there that you can use to save. Um, the, the other okay. thing I wanted to say is, is Peter and I have also been chatting in the background, um, and... Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I think he's kicking himself for a little bit that he didn't come, although the conversation would have been very different if Peter had come, as Nicole mm-hmm. and I both know. Uh, but it, it would have also been good. Uh, but Peter has yeah. asked, um, uh, because Peter, as I said, is a big uh, Latourian uh, fan. Yeah. Um, yeah. He would be really grateful. But the trouble is with OCAD is we don't have access to a lot of the articles. So I don't know if you've got yeah. manuscripts of your papers up online somewhere. Yeah, actually, uh, let, let me share it right now because this way I'm, uh, I'm sure we've, we've got it. Could you just hop into the LinkedIn group and, and make the post to the comments to this meeting and then everybody gets the links? Okay, yeah, yeah. Is, is that possible? Hey, hang on, I'll, I'll get you the link yeah. to the post and then you can do it really fast. Because uh, I, I also recognize we've got to make this easy for you. Hold on just one second. Yeah, and I've copied the, uh, I've actually made sure the chat's been copied from today. Um, so it's, in, it's already in the SSBMG folder as well. Oh, well, okay, great. And, and the recording will be there in about an hour's time. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, it's got a process. And we're still recording this now, by the way. Oh, are we? Okay. The, the thing, no, that's good. Actually, I, I, I like that. Hopefully, uh, is it okay if you put that online as well? Because also this, this kind of follow-up discussion, I think it's yeah, very yeah. relevant. No, I think, I think that's good. Yeah. I mean, we, we do want to encourage this stuff to happen. Here's the link, uh, yeah. um, uh, Oliver, to th- th- that's the link to your post. So if you just want to post your papers, um, and, and I will then man- mention to Peter. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that you've done that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Cool. I'm gonna do that. That's great. All right, folks. Well, well, thanks a lot. Really, really nice uh, speaking to you. And uh, well, hopefully we're gonna gonna be in touch. Yeah, I um, I'm gonna come to Berlin. So. Yay! Well. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, pretty excited about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Perfect. Well. Then um, have a good rest of the day and yes. uh, see you soon then. Yes, good luck. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Oliver. Bye. And see you in Bye. July. Yeah, see you yes. then. Bye. Yeah, you can go get a drink, buddy. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>